take place. We can start. Please. Thank you. Once again. <laughs> Welcome on if you want to have a seat, we can start. Thank you very much. Yes. <clears throat> so welcome back, everybody. We continue with our uh, topic, palliative care for everyone. I see there is a lot of interest. People can't uh, seem to stop uh, discussing in the breaks, which is important part of networking. And we acknowledge that uh, the time is never enough. So uh, optimistically, we started at 11. It's just seven minutes past, so that's still fine. Uh, we have our first speaker, uh, Professor Anne van den Hoek. Uh, she was a chaplain, and at present, she's a professor of spiritual care in the University of Leuven. Uh, the, cheer the cherry or the yeast, contribution of the chaplain in spiritual care. Anna, the floor is yours. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, press the button. Press the button. Right. I'll say that again. Good morning, everyone. I'm go just going to start with asking. Um, who here is a chaplain or involved in chaplaincy training and research? Well, look around, people. They are here, and they have the best profession in the world, according to me. <laughs> My name is Anne. I'm Catholic. I'm a lay woman. And I worked for 14 years as a chaplain in different hospitals sent by my bishop back in Belgium. Now, I know that for too many of you, if you talk about chaplaincy, this is the kind of reaction you get. From the side of healthcare, the question for too many of you is, why do we need chaplains, and what do they do? Why, what are they doing different than what we are already doing regarding spiritual care? And for the side of churches and faiths, the question is often, can lay people do chaplaincy, and um, should we appoint chaplaincy, or can people from communities visit 
palliative care settings, hospices, and hospitals. So there are a lot of questions around chaplaincy, and I'm trying to answer some of them in a limited time. Um, The first thing that I want to tell you about chaplains is that they are multilingual. Chaplains need to speak a lot of languages. There is their mother tongue, which is the language of their faith, belief, their theology. But when they come in the setting of palliative care, they need to speak the language of care, the language that patients and their loved ones use to talk about their spirituality. They need to speak, unfortunately, a language of economics. They need to speak a language of research. But above all, they speak a language of stories. Chaplains are bearers of stories. They listen to sacred stories, stories of how people in palliative care find meaning or have a loss of meaning. It's about their spiritual resources, their spiritual pain, their spiritual distress. I'm happy to stand next to this beautiful statue of the resurrection. I had a patient once that I called my resurrection patient. He was declared death in uh, the surgery room, but he was declared wrongly dead in the surgery room and I found out that he was still alive while I was making funeral arrangements with his family. And when the doctor came back to tell the family that the patient was still alive, it was just a miscommunication, the family only trusted the chaplain because they didn't trust any medical staff member anymore. And the chaplain is often that a person of trust in the midst of medical care. I look from the point of view of the spiritual language, one of the languages that a chaplain needs to speak, to palliative care and the palliative care setting as a womb. Why a womb? Because as many of the speakers, Monica and you also, told us this morning, it's a sacred space. Palliative care is a sacred space. It's like you enter a sacred space where you hear sacred stories and witness sacred stories. It's kind of a microcosmos of how we want the world to be because the strength and the force of care is showed there every day. The strength and the force of compassionate care, which is very important. But it's also a place of mercy where relationships are restored and healed, where things happen between people that are sacred. It's a place to transform, to look back on your life and prepare yourself for death. It's a place of strong connectedness, relationally and spiritually. And it's a place of transition from here to there. And often, a chaplain is a creator of space where those things can happen. Transition, transformation, mercy, rituals. Chaplains know how to create space for that. And that's one of the things that I want to tell you about chaplains. If I look to chaplaincy in palliative care from my own perspective as a Catholic, I go back to the book of Ruth. And Ruth is a woman going to another country with a mother-in-law, and this painting reminded me of the core of palliative care, pallium, a cloak around people. And Ruth says, wherever you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. And this is something that chaplains do every day. They go where patients go spiritually, and they stay where patients are spiritually. Now the title of my lecture today is, is chaplaincy the cherry on the cake or is it the yeast in the dough? And I'm very cruel to show you this picture of a pie with a cherry. It looks very yummy. 
Now you could argue that a pie is as yummy without the cherry. And the cherry just gives a little extra flavor. Unfortunately, this is the way how still a lot of people look at chaplaincy and spiritual care. Spiritual care in this drawing is situated in the last days and hours of care, which is very unfortunate because spiritual care works best and chaplains work best when integrated. So I like to say that a chaplain cannot be and spiritual care cannot be the cherry on top of the cake, but it needs to be the yeast in the dough. You put yeast in the dough in order to bake a cake, but when the cake is finished, you cannot discern the yeast anymore because it has gone up in the whole cake. It's invisible, but it's very necessary and fundamental in order have to have a cake that you can actually eat. And this is how spiritual care should be the yeast in the dough and how chaplaincy should be integrated. It should start from the beginning of palliative care, optimizing quality of life, maximizing community support, use a palliative approach for life-limiting illness. It should be in end-of-life care programs and protocols, and of course, it should be in the last days and hours. Many of you maybe will say, well, we all do spiritual care, and this morning we heard excellent examples of that, how a doctor does spiritual care, and I'm fortunate to refer also to Christina, who, uh, as a doctor, will talk to you about spiritual care and values spiritual care very much. Why do we need chaplains? Well, first of all, people, we are trained for this aspect of care. We are trained for spiritual care. Now, trainings of chaplains are different in various parts of the world. I used to be a coordinator for the European Network of Healthcare Chaplains, 27 countries or 28 countries and 28 different ways of training chaplains. So it's, it's not easy to talk about the training for chaplains. We have in my country a master for chaplaincy, but also diocesan uh, trainings for chaplaincy, it differs very much. But every chaplain is trained in spiritual care competencies and professional competencies. It's a going together of vocation and profession. We have a code of ethics, we have standards, we have professional associations. And our knowledge comes out of knowing our own tradition, whether we are Jewish chaplains, uh, pandit chaplains, whether we are humanist chaplains, Catholic chaplains, Protestant chaplains, Muslim chaplains, there is a variety of chaplains around, but we bring with us a thorough knowledge of our own tradition, but also of other traditions and of the contemporary research for meaning. We have a theory of spiritual care, and we are trained to speak the language of spirituality. The language of spirituality is not an easy language sometimes. It's very obvious when people say, well, why does God do this to me? Then you are talking in a spiritual and a religious language. But often people hide spirituality behind metaphors and symbols. Well, we are trained to deal with it that way. And most, of, most important maybe in regards to spirituality, we learned how to bring our own spirituality in dialogue with theory and research so that we can take our spirituality and make it useful for patients. They can mirror this themselves, they can be supported by it, but they can also find a free space to develop their own spirituality. Paul Ricoeur called the bringing your own spirituality and your first naivete in relationship to critical questions coming to a seconde naivete, a second naivete. And I think it's very important for chaplains to go there and to come there so that you can handle your own spirituality um, as an instrument in the relationship. Despite the secularization in the Western countries, we experience with new generations of chaplains that the word chaplain, despite people not longer identifying with one particular religion, 
still make a connection between the word chaplain and the word trust and confidentiality. And it's an essential characteristic that chaplains bring into palliative care. People associate us with trust and confidentiality. And there is this whole discussion about charting as a chaplain, which is uh, very contemporary. I think chaplains should chart, but in a functional way, keeping the confidentiality of the patient that patient is counting on. Chaplains are trained to deal with powerlessness. We all feel powerless. It is what we are supposed to feel in connection with suffering, and suffering that sometimes is so overwhelming that it is making you powerless. But you can let powerlessness overrule you. It can paralyze you. It can isolate you from the other. Chaplains use powerlessness as a space where connectedness and new things can happen. As a chaplain, we are trained to go from a level of facts in stories that people tell us to the level of emotion, but also to the level of spirituality. In my country, young people don't talk with a religious language about their spirituality anymore. They talk with the language of feelings about their spirituality. So chaplains are trained to discern the language of feelings and through that come to spirituality, come to meaning of life of young people. Chaplains are used to dealing, in, especially in the setting of palliative care, with fears and ultimate hope. And I quote two doctors who wrote about that. As another chaplain once taught me, distinguishing between fears that occur before the last breath and fears that occur after the last breath is a great way to help determine whose expertise is needed at the bedside, where he then refers to the chaplain. And Daniel Salmazi speaks about the ultimate hope is spiritual. There is hope which is connected to the disease and to life as it is happening in daily life. But there is also ultimate hope who surpasses it there. It is a transcendent hope. What do I believe is the meaning of life after my death? Where will I go? And hope is a very important issue for chaplaincy. There was this study, and now I'm going to speak a little bit about in the language of research. There is this study in 2015 done by George Fidget and others. What do chaplains do in palliative care? And the 500 chaplains who participated in the research answered that their primary activities are building relationships, and this is something very important. Chaplains need to be able to build relationships with patients and loved ones within the frame of one encounter. And it's something we are trained to do. And this relationship is the frame for spiritual work and activity. Ritual support belongs to the core of primary activities of chaplains introducing spiritual care to loved ones and patients, connecting patients with their faith communities. Think back of the first slide where chaplains are not involved in uh, strengthening community ties. Well, this is something that we consider as one of our primary activities. Taking care of death, dying, grieving, aligning patients' values with goals of care, now, chaplains work best when they are integrated in teams because then they know the goals of care for patients and they can align work towards aligning patients' values with the goals of care. And the more chaplains are integrated, the higher they score on this item and the higher patient satisfaction becomes. Of course, chaplains deal with existential and spiritual distress. And one of the hard things that chaplains deal with is people who are having trouble with images of God or gods they believe in. 
Whether you believe in God or not, you have an image of God or you have images of gods. And chaplains are trained to deal with this. And I read this magnificent book of Marion muller collard She's a hospital chaplain, a Protestant one from France, L'Autre Dieu, La Plainte, La Menace et La Grâce, where she tackles um, the images of God that are making it harder for people to go through suffering. And she goes through the book of Job to discover a new image of God when she herself is struck by suffering. I really advise you to read this book. And one of the images that she holds dearly is God as a source of resilience. God who pulls people again and again back to the source of life. Chaplains are good builders of bridges. They make communication better between patients, loved ones, and staff. A research into pediatric palliative care by doctors and medical doctors and chaplains in 2012 came to the result that if a chaplain is involved, the communication between patients and staff and their loved ones is improved. Chaplains help and support patients in life balance stories. Looking back, what was meaningful, what is unfinished, what is finished. And of course, based on their spirituality, chaplains try to explore the spirituality of patients and help and support them in deciding on end of life care. What do you want? Therefore, advanced care without involving spirituality is basically a no-go. Spirituality includes not only a relationship with God or gods, but it's also about values. It's about a psychosocial identity that gives room to spirituality. Quality of life experience over and over questionnaires show that it's higher when spiritual care happens. And I think chaplains also follow up on bereaved ones um, after the death of patients. Now, Christina will explain to you more about the model she believes strongly in, that everyone is a generalist in spiritual care. Everyone is supposed to do spiritual care and palliative care. But there are also specialists, chaplains, people who are trained to do nothing else but that. And she will explain uh, more later. But I just want to give you an example of three recent researches. Um, in the Netherlands, for example, in a comparison with staff on ICUs, 66% states that they feel competent to deal with spiritual issues. And you wouldn't expect that of ICUs, but the number is even higher in palliative care. And there is a recent research of Joop van de Geer, who is also part of the European Task Force for Spiritual Care, who says that teaching staff members on how to do generalist spiritual care has an effect. The effect is greater on nurses than on medical doctors, and that's because if you don't use a medical doctor in the training, and the world of chaplaincy is closer to that of nurses than of doctors, I have to admit, but if you use a doctor and you involve a doctor in the training of staff, then it becomes different. Um, Traugott Roser, who is a German pastoral theologian and others, um, published an article saying that we should be aware that even in a generalist approach, everyone does spiritual care. Uh, there are a lot of hurdles to do that. People say, well, we don't have time for that. Uh, we are insecure. We don't know what to do with the answers of patients. What about their privacy? What if we do harm? And he pleads, indeed, like the two previous ones, for training and counseling by chaplains. I know a hospital where the oncologist in the Netherlands hired a chaplain part-time to be nothing else but a counselor to his staff members to go through them through verbatims and cases to shadow them in order for them to learn to do spiritual care. I think this is a very meaningful thing. Chaplains are often involved in family meetings. And 
family members count sometimes on the chaplains to bring in that what they don't dare to say or to strengthen their voice and we come across the bridge function of chaplains. I think that chaplains, if you have a chaplain in palliative care, you will notice a difference in your culture, the culture of the unit of the team, because chaplains are there also to mean, make room for the sacred. In interdisciplinary teams, they bring up spiritual issues. They make sure it's discussed they bring on in other perspectives, they mentor, but they also make room for the sacred in terms of staff support and staff rituals. Staff care is sometimes a major part of chaplaincy in hospitals and in palliative care settings. Debriefings, comfort, listening to personal problems in regards to care, all these things are part of the job of chaplains. Now, uh, you are probably getting tired of hearing the word chaplain, and chaplains are trained too, but I need to get it out because I'm very passionate about the profession of chaplaincy. But the voice of the patient is more important than that. And in the recent years, I have seen a boom in literature on spiritual care and research on spiritual care, but too little research and too little um, articles on research done by chaplains on chaplaincy about their impact on patients and the voice of patients in that. So that's why we started recently, last year, with a European Research Institute for Chaplaincy in Healthcare, and my colleagues from Australia and the US and Asia are doing the same, gathering together and putting strength and forces together to do more research. And the research that we started with is the voice of the patients. How do patients look at chaplains? What do they contribute? What is the value of chaplaincy in the life of patients? And we use a validated research instrument for that and we start in six European countries uh, Ireland, um, who is present here, UK, um, Estonia, Czech Republic, Belgium, the Netherlands, later on Germany, where we use a validated instrument, Promise of Spiritual Care for Patients, where they fill in some questions on the visit of the chaplain, and they have also room to share a narrative of the visit of the chaplain and what the chaplain made as a difference in their lives. Um, we are able to use this instrument thanks to the NHS in Scotland and Austin Snowden who developed the method or the, the research method. And in the UK we are going to do the research in the setting of a palliative care. Now preliminary findings show that in a test phase show that the narratives are very important and that the narratives of patients and the narratives of chaplains on the same contact are the same. And that's a very important finding right there and then. And a second finding is that um, what patients value very much is that they find the space with the chaplains to talk about what is in their mind right there, right then. I'm not going to go into the research too much because that would give us um, you know, a shortage of time. But I think that I will leave it at that and wait for your uh, questions um, afterwards. Thank you so much. <laughs>